I didn't do what? <laughs> he asked me for a caption for the classroom for Becky's post. Yeah. And I gave him the greatest caption in the history of mankind. Tell him what it said. And then he ignored it <laughs> and said, oh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> Give me a real one now. No, that's no, no. Thing. Come on. No, no, like, no. This, <laughs> this dude makes Power Rangers documentaries and I posts know, them exactly. on YouTube, but he's not going to take a Notorious B.I.G. Listen. Lyric. Like, <laughs> laid out for <laughs> Becky and not posted. I watched no, that no. entire Power Rangers documentary like this. Yeah. I was just well, in shock. I, 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 I had that look on my face when I was watching to make it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was sitting there all weekend. What like, are we doing? <laughs> I still think that is the most underrated CrossFit video ever made. Oh man. How many views does that have? Not enough. Not as, not as many yeah, as it's, it's got like 620 people. Yeah, we'll started. do a podcast just on that, that. Run. No, we need to do a podcast on the making of the sequel. Ooh, I don't know do. if we need a sequel. I, th I think people make too many sequels these days. Just let a good thing be. Listen, know, this man. is something that let's go back to this text though, because I followed up my text immediately with, you know what? Never mind. Let's use it. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> something like that. Uh, no, it was semi a real one. It was great. Semi a real one. <sighs> okay. We have right. to, I, for the audience, they need to understand that when Chris makes a decision, he makes a decision and he doesn't yeah. follow through with anybody else's decisions. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, that's stupid. All media decisions go through Chris. I mean, I respect that. I feel like that's, it's a good thing to have a filter where it's all like through yeah. that person. No, lens. for sure. Yeah. I mean, he's the one that's creating the, the content and doing an amazing job. So yeah. right here, I'm looking at the text or we can go with that. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Now that we've talked about it this long and I'm probably going to keep this in, let's, let's read what you thought the caption should be. So it's a post for our classroom where Becky's teaching. She is walking through a program design for somebody who's trying to work on gymnastics, strict strength. Okay. And, and so Chris says, Hey, send me a caption for this. Cause I'm getting no, ready to post it on I Instagram. I always post the like ridiculous ones. So I'm like, occasionally our Instagram needs something like where it looks like we know what we're talking about. I feel like more than occasionally we're serious on there. Okay. So he sends Becky, Becky, Becky. Can't you see? <laughs> Sometimes your words just hypnotize me. Awesome. That is right? fantastic. Awesome. And yeah. I followed and it up. It, well, yeah, no, he finished it even. And then, then I said, swipe up to see her flashy ways. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why would you not Why do would that? you not post that? Oh, that's fantastic. All right, we'll do that. We'll, we'll do a repost later. Yeah. Yes, please it's, do. It's over now. Maybe we should do a little vote on the podcast. The moment is yeah, past. Someone. All right, let's talk about what we want to talk about. We've wasted. This is, no, this is good content. Well, the, the last thing about Chris, I will, we'll be filming in here. Like, you know, we're doing a new course right now. And I, the other day, like I thought I hammered this piece. Like I just, I didn't make any mistakes. That's Everything sounded feeling. really, yeah. That's a good And feeling. Chris is over here with his hoodie up laughing at me. <laughs> I'm like, dude, are you serious? I just did I mean, a great job. To be honest, you did bring a good energy. You really nailed it. Were you laughing you when he was done or, the whole, or during the thing? While I'm doing it. You oh, said yeah. something that was ridiculous. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> what did he did he bring Tom Brady into the equation? What what was that it? I do you did. remember? How about Tom Brady last Dude, night? Screw though. Tom Brady. Uh, no, Tom, no, no, Tom, you watch your mouth. No, no, no. This is a great topic because Tom is a masters athlete and he is still at the highest level of his sport. Well where then he guys, needs to stop wearing a nineteen year old's haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Go you guys, frost your tips, motherfucker. Have you guys seen the picture? What, that guy can do whatever exactly. he wants. Have you seen the picture Cowboys, of the, when he came into the league and then the picture of last year and how he looks younger now than he did in whenever, whatever how year that was? How much of that is just the money that that guy has made? Yeah, well, it's definitely the money. And being married to a model, she's probably like, you need to go get Botox. <laughs> <laughs> Who's he married to? I know, Giselle. Giselle that, that sounds like her. I don't know what. what, what yeah. I don't know. She doesn't take the Brady It's not name. Brady. No, yeah, it's She's not. got her own brand that she has to protect. And she's worth more than he is. No, it's interesting because you were just talking about Tom Brady and you were saying that there are still aspects of his game that are deteriorating, right? Like the dude yeah. was never known to be a, a, a rusher. Like he was yeah, never he like a dual run. threat quarterback. Mm. He was always this guy that's going to sit back and pick his spots. But even those qualities of himself are starting to deteriorate a little bit and he's changing his game as a result it's, of it. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking off camera, but I think this is like a really good point may lead into some of the stuff we want to talk about today. One of the things that's so impressive is now he, because he knows that like his arm strength, for example, is not the same. He still can zip it around there better than obviously most yeah. guys, but yeah. like there are guys, Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers who have these cannons. He doesn't have that anymore. So one of the things that Brady has done is now he's timing up his throws to where he's throwing it even sooner than he used to. So like if you watch it down the field view, you would notice that as the guys maybe two steps before his cut, yeah. Brady's already throwing the ball. So he's timing it up so that it gets there when he gets out of his cut. Whereas before maybe it was one step out of his cut. Yeah. It's just amazing that he can time those things up. And I think that comes with experience and just how good he is. But those kind of things that he's always trying to figure out, like how do I still have the edge or how can I get the edge without the talent 
that I had before. Yeah, the physical capacity that he had Correct. before. Because yeah. that, I mean, I think one of the things I remember hearing about Brady back in the day was that he threw like one of the heaviest balls. Like it came at you with so much momentum that it was just hammering into your hands. And like that obviously is going to go away right. as you get into your 40s. You're not going to have as much velocity. You're probably also not going to have as much throwing volume. I imagine they protect his numbers For a little sure. bit there with a little bit more run game. But it is interesting to see like, I don't know. And the question that I asked you was, was that a conscious awareness decision that he made that he's like, man, my velocity is going down. I need to throw this ball a little bit earlier to make sure that it's timed at the same point that it was five, 10, 15. How long has he been playing? 20, 20, 22, 22 yeah, 20 years. 20 years when yeah. he first came out of college to make sure that it's getting to that guy at the same point in his route means I have to throw it two or three seconds earlier. I feel like that's just something that he's naturally yeah. accepted or uh, maybe unconsciously settled into over time where he's making that adjustment. Yeah. And it's interesting to think about because that has to happen in other sports, right? For sure. As our bodies change, it's not like this phase by phase thing. It's a gradual thing that shifts and we have to constantly shift our perception of ourselves, our awareness of ourselves and how we're accomplishing the same tasks that we did five, 10, 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's so true. And that's something that I try to preach to my master's athletes in the sport of CrossFit. It's like, look, it, it, we always joke about that word deteriorate. Like Max said it a couple of years ago and then like all these masters, decay. decay, whatever, like, but people are like, Oh, you know, I'm a master's athlete. I'm decaying. But at some level, like all of us are kind of decaying a little bit We're as, all we, dying. Uh, yeah, as we, as <laughs> we get older than others. And so then the question is, well, how do I <clears throat> one mitigate that quote unquote decay or deterioration that's happening? And then two, how do I deal with it so that I can still be a high level performer in let's say the that's sport of CrossFit. That's what the master's program should be called. TTT mitigate. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Decay <laughs> mitigation. I, I think that uh, deterioration happens probably in two ways. Like one of it is physical. Like yes. your joints get a little bit more beat up. Um, your energy levels might be a little bit more lower and not as consistent as you want. Um, I think the other side of it is performance decay that sure. might be separate from a physical decay. Like you'll see somebody who has um, been around the sport for a long time. Like they just can't hammer things as intensely as often as they used to right. be able to do. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to try and think about not necessarily trying to bring the peak of their performance curve up a little bit higher. It's trying to keep it at that level for a little bit longer, I think is new, is the new goal. Right. And it's also too, like it may be performance gains can still happen within that, you know, quote unquote decay. I don't want to keep using that word, but the way that we think about that is the same way that we're talking about Tom Brady. Like he's keeping his performance high by changing the way he does yeah. things so that he can throw the ball you know, two steps out of someone's cut as opposed to it being a little bit faster, whatever exactly. it may be. Yeah. He's making that, um, he's making compensations for the physical deterioration Correct. by making sure the performance tries to stay up here. And I was trying to draw a difference between those two curves. Yeah. I think he's solving that problem brilliantly. For sure. I what? had a question for you. Um, yeah. I'm going to be an awful friend. How old are you? 30, <laughs> 30, 33, 31. Uh, 30, 30, 30, yeah. 32 in October. So 32 right. a month away. Here's the question that I have. Um, and you have to answer this. You can't be around the bush. <laughs> what are the factors that would have to be in play for you to compete as a master in the 35? There, like, there are no, 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 no factors. No, no, no. Imagine a perfect world. So like, uh, kids sleep all the way through the night. Your knee is, is <laughs> magically fixed. Uh, all of your workload went away because you won the lottery. Well, what, yeah. what does it look like for you? To, it would to, have to, to be, be those compete? things. Those three. Um, I, you know, the thing is for me is it, the priority number one is family. And so that it would have to be like, I am. I only have to train maybe 90 minutes a day or less and still can perform at a you high level. You could do that. Brandon Dorman could do that. No, train at I, 90 minutes I don't and know. be able to perform at a high level. I just love the idea of being able to come in here and train, you know, like I do now with 30 to 60 minutes a day and then get my work done and then go home and like hang out with the kids or do, or maybe it's not that maybe selfishly, like I want to go play golf or I want to do yeah. other things. So, um, I don't want to make it just like, Oh, my family's holding back. Cause that's not by any means what it is. But for me, I really enjoy the lifestyle that I have right now. Uh, and I still feel fit. I feel healthy other than like some of the knee issues that I've had, especially flare up with like after the car accident last yeah, year and all yeah. that. Uh, so I, I kind of like where I'm at, but you know, who knows? Uh, three, four years is a long time. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I was hoping to create that uh, future world for you so that you could be I'm able just, to compete. I'm just saying that because the cameras are on. <laughs> <laughs> There's no chance of that being yeah. a reality. What's amazing now though, is like the 35 to 39 division has, it really has gotten so much better over the last couple of years, because all of the quote unquote OGs are now in that. So they, they took a couple of years off like the Dan Bailey. I know he, he got screwed with the COVID thing at the games, but that and Casper Bauer and, and all these other guys that 
they were so good, what, maybe like seven, eight years ago, yeah. they took some time off, they healed their bodies and now they're training hard again. And they're, the numbers are just incredible in that division. It's interesting. Cause I think that that's going to continue to sort of work its way up the divisions. Cause you're going to see more and more right. people who've been in CrossFit for a long time who have now associated themselves as CrossFitters in their heads and they don't want to give it up. And so these people are going to continue to age up. And I think the quality of the master's divisions is going to increase as a result of that. You're going to get guys who've been in the sport for 10, 15 years as they continue to go 35 to 39. 40 yeah. to 44 and on the way up. Um, and I think it's one of the things that we want to make sure that we talk about today in terms of trying to predict performance trends along different age divisions. For sure. I think it's something that's really important for masters athletes to make sure that they are keeping a context around like the people that they need to be competing against. It might not be the same people that they're competed against today. It might not be the same people that they competed against last year. Um, how are you measuring what those differences are from group to group. And then how are you trying to adjust your training schedule and your training sort of priorities to make sure that it aligns with where you think that you need to be or on your next competition season. So one of the really cool things that you did for the classroom was you put together an analysis, basically trying to break that down as best we could with the data that we have. Yeah, um, It's not going to be perfect, but it does allow us to at least see some trends in terms of performance deterioration over time from division to division, um, even also some very specific numbers for Metcon versus strength. And I think this is going to be a conversation that can be really, really productive for masters as they continue to try and think about themselves long-term, right? For sure. For the sport to continue to grow and get better. I, I forget the numbers, but it's over like 50% of the total registrants in the open was age group. Yeah. Like there are there's a hundred and almost 50,000 masters, so athletes. Many masters yeah. athletes. And they, they kind of just get brushed to the side for the most part. And most of the conversations around training and I think you and I would agree it's a huge disservice to that big of a population, that big of a percentage Absolutely. chunk of the total athletes. So um, hopefully this conversation can help shed them or help them shed a little light on what training might need to look like. And it might not be what they thought before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I, I completely agree with you, I think there's a lot there, but one of the things that CrossFit can do better, not to make this about what they need to change, but like is spend more time with the master's athletes yeah. and grow that side of the sport. Because one, there's just more money in that side of the sport. So much more disposable yeah, income. Exactly. So yeah. those people can help grow the sport. And they're the ones that also like have more connections in you know, their day-to-day -day life. They're working with other businesses or if they own their business, they're telling other, you know, their clients, Hey, I do CrossFit yeah. and like, look how fit and in shape I how am. How many views people. they got on TikTok? Right? <laughs> that is true. That is true. They but don't I, even know what TikTok is. I think that that's something that CrossFit it needs to think about long-term. Uh, and it also it ties into the health aspect of this, of just like the CrossFit brand, you know, like Glassman before he left, I know he made this big push for like the health and wellness side. Well, mm. if we have more masters athletes that are high performers and they do it correctly, which is one of the things we'll talk about later, then that's a, like a proven, like, look at what CrossFit did for me. I was in pain at 35, but now I'm 45 and I'm doing all these amazing things. One of the greatest, uh, post, uh, workout interviews that we heard when we were at the games was that masters guy. Do you remember him? when he basically like we were inside the Coliseum and he finished first in his heat and he gave this post event, uh, oh, yeah. interview that, oh, I mean, I almost started tearing up. It was yeah. so like, he was talking about the health problems that he had before uh -huh. about how he transitioned into CrossFit. He was talking to his family in the stands over the microphone. Like it was the yeah. greatest so moment, awesome. like over the course of the weekend, like there was lots of cool things that happened, but seeing that, like seeing the impact that it has on somebody's health and longevity and quality of life as they get into the later years, like it was amazing to see. And I, I, I hope that if we can get more masters athletes, and also get them, like you said, the attention and the resources that they deserve. We're going to have a much bigger positive impact on the population as yeah. a whole. I think two things need to happen in the master's categories, uh, you know, from an individual level though, if you want to see the sport grow on those levels, the athletes need to think about kind of two things. One is making sure that they stay healthy long-term. The, yeah. the, the, the biggest threat to the master's divisions are those that go too hard too soon and end up falling out of the sport, which we've seen that that yeah. is a trend or a tendency in the master's divisions right now is people go really hard at 45 or 50, 55, whatever age group that they're in. And they end up leaving in two or three years because they're completely broken. And then that does a disservice to the sport as a whole, because that is not health and wellness, do right? Do you think that that's because of the nature of the sport? Or do you think that that's just due to the, the athlete? sort of like wherever they came from, like if they came from a sport background or football background or something else, like, is that something that's inside of the mentality of the athlete or is the sport set up to almost put that athlete at a greater risk for overdoing things? I, I, there, there, I think there is a trend that sports probably too aggressive with the master's athletes. I know that master's athletes probably get frustrated when we say that because they always want more. Yeah. Um, but when we, when we put out the volume 
that we test at the games or the volume that we test at on these online competitions, it's hard not to want to do that much in your training. Yeah. So I think every master's athlete needs a good coach by their sides. I've said this before, but I, I see myself as like the guardrails for an athlete. Like, Hey, I'm letting you run free, but let me kind of just guide the process. So you don't fall off the cliff. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. we're going up this like narrow stairwell and I'm just going to make sure that you don't fall off either side. Uh, we need more good coaches that are doing that with our master's athletes to kind of guide that process. And also to rein them in when things are getting a little overreached and they are getting yeah. beat up. Yeah. Uh, to be a high performer, you do have to do a little bit more than maybe you had to 10 years ago. And I think it's that that's going to continue to be the case in the sure. sport, unless they just like drastically change the way that they program for master's divisions. But with that said, I do think that we, the, the problem in my opinion, with the sport in general is we always look up to the best performers and we Absolutely. think we have to do what they have to do. Yeah. So Rich Froning, you know, back in the day, they had that documentary where it's like they followed him around. They said, look, he did 12 workouts that day. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that. That's one of the I first remember. CrossFit That's, things. He was I also eating peanut butter and jelly out of a bowl, I think. Right, right. And but what's funny about it is they considered like, oh, he did snatch 10 singles. That was one workout. Yeah. <laughs> and then he went to the next one's like, well, yeah. that's just a training session like he's going through. But regardless of that, we see that and we think, well, I need to do that to be at his level. But then we see someone like Frazier who really, I, it seems like he did the opposite. He took a couple months off every single year. He was very smart about his training. It's probably why he's still really healthy and doesn't have any issues. He, he, Frazier could probably come back and still be super competitive. So there are all these different ways that you may be able to do it, but we always think that that whole, we got to go as hard as we possibly can. That's the only way that we can get it done. That may not be the case for master's athletes. It may not be the case for you know younger athletes too. Yeah. But I think that one of the things I've always tried to tell mas the master's athletes I've worked with is it's not necessarily anymore about how much you're doing. It's about the quality of the work that you're doing, yeah. making sure that we're hitting the targets that we have. So there are still things that we have to do a lot of, but making sure that the quality is there so that we can stay healthy all year. Because if you have a full year of quality training and you're already a decent performer in the master's divisions, you're going to be ahead of at least 90% of the population because most people are hurt. They're off for a couple of weeks. They injured their back. They're off a couple of weeks. They hurt their shoulder. Oh, that's just what I've seen. Like you watch, follow Instagram, many master's athletes, and they're always broken. So yeah. that's kind of the first thing I'm thinking about. Yeah. And in the sport of fitness, I feel like it's a little bit easier to be tempted to want to ignore the physical signs that your body might be giving you, especially as a master's athlete. Like you might work under the assumption that you kind of have to have elbow pain. You kind of have to have knee pain. And I don't think it's the case. And I think that you might agree that we need to be able to pick our spots where those kinds of mechanical issues, those kinds of energy level issues are maybe, um, to be expected, but at a certain point in the season where there's no other choice, but now, Hey, like we have to start ramping up because the games are four weeks out and this is like the, the hard block. It's not like that year round. You have yeah. to be able to pick your battles and you have to know what you can push through, what it's in smart not to push through and make sure that you take a step back, adjust the training. And I think in order to do that, it almost requires a objective perspective, which is as you, what you were saying, the coach with the guardrails, right? Yeah. Hey coach, I woke up today my back was real sore. I slept like crap. Um, you have snatch percentage work today. Should I hit this? Should I, should I lower the percentages? Should I do some work off the blocks? What should I do? That coach is there to help protect them from themselves. So they're not having to make those decisions over and over. And I think masters athletes, they're going to bump up against those decisions probably a little bit more often because they have so many other confounding factors that go on in their life. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. One of the guys that I, I kind of guided through that process leading into the games was a uh, 65 plus masters athlete. And when he came on, basically we just did assessment. His coach, um, Andrew out in Las Vegas basically connected with us and said, Hey, I want some guidance on how to prep him for the games." And yeah. so we did assessment and we basically ran through all the numbers. And I looked at it and I said, Hey, look, our only goal. And he probably think, thought I was crazy when I said this is just to make sure that you're healthy between now and the games, we're not going to do any hard work. And we, for literally 12 weeks, we didn't do anything that was super intense. All we worked on is movement quality and making sure that he stayed healthy. And I said, if you do those two things in the 65 plus category, you're going to end up finishing in the top 10. And he barely got in in the qualifier. Uh, and I think at some point there was probably some pushback there. He probably thought I was oh, a little yeah. bit wild that yeah. we're, we weren't doing a ton of really hard stuff. Uh, MQPO. What's that mean? Movement quality pays off. Um, yeah, I like that. I'm going to make a shirt. <laughs> and, um, and he, he kind of bought into that towards the end. He even took some time off because he started getting some back pain. He said, Hey, I'm not going to do this today. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the last three weeks, if you saw his training log, you'd be like, there's no way that he's prepped for the games. He ended up finishing seventh overall, which is, I mean, was a huge accomplishment for, for him. And obviously he did a great job. I mean, at the games and that's all on him. Everything that he did was the, the work that he put in. But sometimes if we want to have that whole concept of hard work pays off, which 
there's nothing wrong with that. I've always believed that that's the case. But sometimes hard work is doing the easy things because that is harder to say, I'm going to pull back or I'm not going to push myself when I'm injured or whatever else it may be. Mm -hmm. So we just have to reframe. We're almost having a paradigm shift, especially when we talk about these masters athletes, have a paradigm shift of the hard work sometimes is doing the easy movement work that I have to do or taking care of my hips when they're tight or my ankles when they're tight, whatever, whatever those things are for you. Yeah. The difficulty in that day is this, it might be the decision that you make. Correct. It might be like, Hey, I'm going to try and avoid the temptation of doing hard stuff today to actually do the stuff that's going to set me up to express my fitness on game day. And that's not always an easy decision. And hopefully that outside perspective of the coach helps you make that decision in a better light and set yourself up for success. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing too, that we have to start thinking about our master athletes should start thinking about the long-term goals that they have. So typically when you come on, if let's say that, you know, all the time someone's like 38 and they want, they have to compete in the 35 to 39 division. They say, Hey, I want to make the games this year. But as you start getting older in that age group, it gets harder and harder to qualify because there are younger and younger people. Now yeah, you mean inside of the actual division correct. itself. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, 35, 39, if I'm on the top end of that, it's hard for me to compete against the 35 and 36 year olds. Right. Yeah. So like if a new group of 35 year olds come in right. and I'm 38 or 39, there's just more competition. The 35 year olds are getting better and better each year because like we already talked about, those are a lot of the kind of originals that were in the sport that now are, that have all the skills. So even if maybe they have decayed a little bit, they still have all the muscle ups and, yeah, and all the other fire breathers. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, the conversation or the way that I would think about this too, is like, is this just like a one year thing for me? Or do I have a long-term approach of like, maybe I'm better off thinking about when I age up to 40, or if I'm a 44 year old, when I age up to 45. And that's kind of where that, that whole classroom piece comes in. One of the things that I wanted to portray to the athletes is sometimes we look at it and we get so frustrated with our scores because we see that we're a couple percentage points off or a minute slower than the younger guys or younger girls in our division. But if we looked at where we're at compared to maybe when I age up in a year, I'm right on target. So yeah. then the process as an athlete and as a coach should be, let's make sure that we're kind of mitigating any losses that we may have, keep those targets in place for, let's say the 40 to 44 division, or if you're aging up to 45, 45 to 49 division, and then let that be our focus. That's yeah. probably a healthier way to look at it so that you're not pushing yourself to something that you can't reach anyhow in that younger division. And then it also gives you a long-term approach so that you stay healthy longer in the sport. Yeah. I think the important part of that, that I'm going to take away is the idea of resetting expectations when you're inside of an age division, Correct. right? So the idea of like, well, I, I honestly, like I need to go and pull the numbers to know, but like, where were the podium finishers inside of each age division? Was it in the first two to three years? I mean, we would probably suspect so. I also imagine there's probably some outliers where there like, are they definitely were like, outliers. I've you know, done the some of those numbers. 49 year old yeah. who actually won the 45 to 49. I imagine that that exists, but it's also like the exception that proves the rule in that sense. So it's the job of the coach and the athlete to make sure that you are setting expectations appropriately about, listen, taking a shot at 35 to 39 when you're 38 is not in your best interest and trying to also gauge your success or failure of your training based off of where you finish in that division is also going to be counterproductive to you. What we yeah. need to do is we need to take the next two years to just sit down and train. We're going to compete for the experience of competing. So you keep that skill in your toolkit. But in the meantime, our expectations for your performance are then going to be shifted to the future to say first two years and 40 to 44, we are going to go for it. We're going to put our eggs Absolutely. in that basket and that's when we're going to go for it because look at where your numbers are here. Look at where they're going to be at. We can also predict like how things are going to change from year to year in terms of that performance. That is your shot. And yeah. I think setting those expectations appropriately also helps that athlete to stay more patient with the process. They don't put too much value into the point that they like, oh man, like I was, you know, top 5% in my age group last year. Now I'm seven and a half percent. Right. It's like, oh, n nothing's working. I need to change things up. It's like, no, 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 this is okay. This is expected. In fact, we're okay with this because this is not the number that we care about. This number two years down the line is the one that we care about. Yeah. They, to give some people just some kind of broad numbers, each, we kind of ran some numbers on, you know, five to six of the most popular open workouts over the last couple of years. And then I took the averages of the best. We just did the male side for this in the classroom piece, but I also have started to pull the, together some of the female sides and everything's pretty similar within a couple percentage points. But with that caveat, uh, the age group from 35 to 39 when you move up to 40 to 44, there's a 10% drop off in total time or reps in, a, in an open workout. And then there's another 10% drop off, give or take a percentage point or two is actually 12% going from 40 to 44 to 45 to 49. And then it's true all the way up until you get to the 55 division where the reps go up. Okay, things or change. Things yeah, change weights because get lighter. Correct. So then might change. Yeah. So your cadence has to be a little bit faster, sure. but the drop off is still there compared to your baseline of the 34 and under division. So your normal or the, just the regular age group group. Yeah. Uh, so to, to, 
kind of to frame that, if I'm 39 years old and I'm a minute behind the, the people that are winning the 35 to 39 division, what I would think about or what I would communicate to that athlete is, hey, look, that time that you got here is perfect for when you age up to 40 to 44 because you're 10% slower. Yeah. But now we just need to make sure that you stay at that target for the yeah. next year. That's when we talk about that word decay or deterioration. That's what we're trying to picture there because there is a very objective deterioration curve that happens Correct. as you go up in age groups. And what we want to try and do is we want to make sure that that drop off that exists at a global level is then also answered with your own curve not being quite as steep on the way back down. Exactly. So you can stay above where it's going to be at as the other one deteriorates. And that's what we talk about with that mitigation the deterioration as much as possible so that as you age up and those 10% natural declines happen, you're able to stay ahead of the curve. Right. So if you think about it, like the difference between 35 to 39 and the 50 to 54 is almost 40% different. Yeah. There's a yeah. huge deterioration well, so there. So on a 10 minute workout, that's three and a half minutes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's a big difference, but we have people that come in all the time and they're like, you know, they're, they are 50 and they're like, look at what these younger guys are doing. I need to be there. I need to do that amount of volume. I need to be yeah. at that speed. Yeah. And even thinking about training at that speed doesn't make sense. It's like, right. no, your the speed, the cadence, the, the paces that we're trying to hold on the rower, yeah. the, the number of double unders you need to do, the number of toes, the to bar, whatever, all of those things that we're thinking about for like open workouts, let's target it at the age group that you're in. Mm -hmm. So that would be the kind of first thing I would think about for a master's athlete is look at your age group or the age group that you're moving into and then come up with some actual targets that make sense as, as opposed to comparing yourself to either those that are winning the younger divisions or just like the main group of 34 and under. Yeah, performance expectations, dictating training expectations, I think is another very important concept that might get glossed over in that in terms of like, all right, if I know that for this kind of open workout or this kind of strength test that the people that I want to be competing against are here, here, and here, then I know what my training needs to look like to try and build me up to that on game day. But if I'm comparing to the wrong people, my training is going to be different. And that training being different or unnecessarily hard or intense or whatever else is then going to injure me and then compromise the consistency that you had mentioned earlier. You, it's just all of that was for nothing, right? All of that was for nothing. So that's the improper comparison that leads to compromised training, which is then going to compromise your performance. Yeah. So performance-based expectations are, or, are very important in terms of making sure that the gauge that you're using to try and set up your whole training year is appropriate and accurate. And it's the, you're comparing yourself against the people that you really should be. Exactly. One of the other things that happens there is if you think you have to do the same volume as maybe like a Frazier or someone like that, if you're yeah. doing, oh, he's, he did 140 toes of bar in this open workout. So yeah. that's the volume I need to train at. What actually happens is I end up bottlenecking myself where now I'm doing singles or doubles yeah. and I'm going slower than the training speed that I need to be practicing. You didn't get the stimulus that, Correct. You, were, that was, you were supposed to get out of that session because of the expectations and comparisons were way off. Yeah. yeah. So, so that can really mess up someone's training and if you do that over and over and over again, you're not training at the speed that you need to for right. your division. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. The same thing is true too with the strength trends. So the strength trends are actually a little bit more impressive to me. They, they maintain a little bit better than maybe the deterioration in like a Metcon score. Yeah, I would have expected that just because when I aged up in a 35, there was, I forget what it was, it was like a max clean or something. And I took like 13,000 or something <laughs> yeah, like that. So you guys are old. You're not supposed to be strong <laughs> yeah. anymore. Yeah. It's like, uh, my skinny legs are still weak, even in my age division. You but know, what's crazy is I look back at the snatch of it from like five or six years ago at the games in the 35 to 39, they averaged 291 pounds in, um, for the top five males in that snatch of it in the master's category. And I was like, how is this possible? I went and looked. It was like, um, what's the guy's name? Neil, uh, Neil Maddox. Yeah. Neil Maddox was there. Another guy that snatched 300 pounds. I mean, it's like all these really strong masters athletes, which is incredible. I mean, Golly. it's amazing that they can do that. The trend typically is like five to 7% per age group. So per age division. Yeah. So if you up. think about like 20.4, we, we aggregated all those scores of the complex, which is a little bit different than just a true one RM, but something that's true to the sport. You see complexes all the time or yeah. a four RM front squat. We did a two RM overhead squat. And most of those are anywhere from five to 7%. As you get a little bit older, those trends, uh, are usually maybe eight to 12%. So a little bit wider. Okay. Um, but again, that happens, especially with something like a front squat and overhead squat, not because of the strength potential. And this is something that I want to talk about, but because of the movement potential, right? When you start mm -hmm. losing, maybe it's a shoulder flexion. So getting your arms overhead, or you don't have good external rotation in the shoulder. So you can't get into a front rack position or other wrist or elbow issues. Yeah. Then it's really hard to express your full strength potential. So this is kind of bouncing around, but the second thing that I always tell these master athletes is think about your movement first 
and then think about the strength gains second. And if you do that and you have the time to worry about that, then you can start to almost raise your ceiling. Like if we can't get into an overhead position to hold the barbell for an overhead squat, it doesn't matter how quote unquote strong your legs are yeah. because you can't hold the barbell. So let's get you to where at least you can hold the barbell overhead pain-free and then start working on your overhead squat or your leg strength or whatever else it may be that you need to work on for that. Yeah, it's interesting to think about it because I feel like a lot of times there are going to be positional deficits inside of the master's athletes as it gets heavier. So it's, yes. it's interesting to think about strength, right? Strength is just such a broad, complex topic. Like you're stronger than I am, but how? Like why? Yeah. Why are you stronger than? Is it because you have more muscle mass? Is it because your positions are better? Is it because that you're better able to tap into your nervous system at any given time? Right. Why is that? I don't know. But for the most part, with the masters athletes that we see, it's usually positional dependent, right? Yeah. Your ability to express strength is going to get compromised over time because your ability to get into the positions that allow you to express strength is compromised over time. So, exactly what you said there, I think, is important. But it's also funny to think about it from like a long-term athletic development standpoint because that's also how you would start with a newbie. Like, yeah. Hey, listen, that I'm is not going to try and make you stronger right now. I'm going to try and get you to get in the positions that we know we need to apply strength into and make you super confident in them, super comfortable in them, super stable and balanced inside of them. So that when the time does come to be able to layer loading on top of that, you're ready for it. And your, and your body is ready for it. your body's ready to express strength there because it trusts the positions and it trusts the connective tissue quality and the joint angles that you're going to have to be inside. Yeah. I, I mean, I still, I, I've said this before on a podcast, I, I'm just like such a firm believer in that movement economy is almost, is, is the king of the sport to me. Yeah. And that's not just how good is your squat position? How good is your overhead position? It's also how well do you move in the movements of the sport? So the first yeah. thing I look at kind of two things when I'm looking at somebody or doing a movement analysis, which is something that actually we're going to start doing uh, online in design. Um, the first thing is how well can they, do, how efficiently can they do a movement? How efficient are their burpees compared to the top performers in the sport? How efficient is their rope climb? So when you say efficiency there, you're talking about the actual rate of the movement? The, the tech, the technical aspect of the movement. So they're using less effort. Per so rep. that exists separately from the quantifiable, like Correct. Rope is three seconds per rep over at squat is two seconds per yeah. rep. You're looking at their ability to move smoothly throughout smoothly the through the rep. Gotcha. And, and this is a little bit subjective because some people are going to move differently than yeah. maybe a top performer and still be able to go at, let's say that the kind of that quantifiable 2.2 seconds or 2.4 seconds per sure. rep. But there's also some things that are just obvious. Like if, if someone can't get the barbell in a front rack position to their shoulders and they're holding thrusters two inches off their shoulders, like that's a very <laughs> obvious thing that it's like, you're limited here. Your ceiling yeah. is low, no yeah. matter how big your engine is, or your capacity is yeah. because you can't handle a front rack position. Yeah, that's different than me trying to compare your squat depth to my squat exactly. depth because we have different femur lengths and different torso right. sizes. Yeah. I got so it. the first thing is that then looking at like, I just call it movement economy, like the efficiency of the movement. Can we, can we teach them to be as efficient as possible at that movement? So they're using less effort per rep. And the second thing is the actual performance marker, which for me is just the, the rep speed, like how fast are they going compared to the best in their age group? Mm -hmm. And so if it's 2.2 seconds per rep for 20 burpees, or if it's 2.6 seconds per rep for toes to bar, whatever that may be in an open workout, I want to compare them to those people and then see, can we drive that number down? Now there are differences based on limb length, based on, you know, how big or how heavy someone is. Like if someone is two, 120 pounds and they're doing burpees versus someone that's 160 pounds or wall ball, someone that has really long femurs or someone that doesn't, how deep their squat position is. All of those things play roles, but yeah. we want to see where, how we can maximize that speed. But we, there's no point in maximizing the speed without first, at least trying to clean up the technical aspects of that movement first. Yeah. I mean, the other thought that I had as you were going down that route was like, you are trying to maximize movement efficiency and economy in terms of trying to improve. Did you just say maximize? I don't think I did. Hey. If I did, then that's not what I meant <laughs> I to say. I love it. That's yeah. the new shirt. Can Max it be a new <laughs> Can we get a picture of Max on there? Oh, nice. Um, Max likes fries. That's what it sounded <laughs> like in my head. Um, yeah, so movement, efficiency, and economy in terms of trying to improve their performance is great. I also think about the longevity of that athlete. And so for sure, picture uh, picture Froning, picture Frazier, picture uh, Tia. Um, I think all of us would say that they move really well. Yeah. And I think that them moving well makes the movements more mechanically healthy and makes their the reps and the volume that they uh, accumulate over time less mechanically stressful and damaging. And it allows them to have sustainability over the course of their career, which allowed them to win back to back yep. to back to back. So yeah, their capacity is amazing. I'm not going to take it away from that. They're all very, very strong athletes, but they all move really, really well for the positional and the just the movement requirements of the sport, squat patterns, overhead patterns. Um, 
I think when we think about master's athletes and we're trying to improve movement economy and movement efficiency, that's another argument that I would say, listen, you're probably going to get faster if we can just make this movement feel smoother, yeah. but like not have as much um, energy resources required per rep, right? But listen, you're probably also going to be a little bit healthier if we can just make you move a little bit smoother to make each one a little bit less stressful on your joints. And I think part of that is just getting the athlete to buy into the yeah. fact that it's not always about performance at the end right. of the day. We want you to be able to walk away from your career as a CrossFitter, like knowing that you did something that's going to positively impact your health and well-being and quality of life down the road. Yeah. I think that the, it's almost like you're thinking about it as let's clean up the movement so that we can raise the ceiling for performance. Yeah. Because otherwise, the, I mean, the ceiling just always is going to stay the same. And it's like, you just keep hitting your head into that ceiling because you're on a trampoline and banging it into it every <laughs> single time. What a visual. <laughs> yeah. I try to give something there, but I feel like that's where most of us are at. I, I mean, I've been there, right? Like I've, I now, especially with my knee, I've got to be very protective about what I do. And I'm trying to demo some of these workouts for the design. It's not easy for me to do some of the movements I used to be able to do, even like a, a simple squat. And so I'm having to find new kind of pathways to squat. But at the same time, I'm also trying to clean up my movement efficiency so that I can get back to being yeah. healthy and performing at a high level. So I empathize with those that don't move well, but want to perform. Yeah. There's a balance there. We're always kind of like trying to find that fine line of like, I want to perform, but I need to clean up this, this movement. But I know for me, a perfect example, if I don't clean up the, the patterns that I have right now, my, I'm never going to be able to perform at a high level again because I'm just going to hit my head into that ceiling. So yeah. I'm trying to think about, can I clean it up to where, just like you said, where I can move with less effort per rep, like just make the squat easier so I don't have to hold my breath and really brace like I am right now. But then also for longevity, like, can I do this for 10 years where I can squat yeah. multiple times a week? Yeah. And because it's a good pattern, I'm not putting pressure on my joints or my hips or lower back because I'm compensating in some weird area. Yeah. You and I know having worked with athletes for years that it's not always an easy argument to present them with, Hey, listen, we need to take a step back and work on movement efficiency for a little bit. I know it's not going to be CrossFit where you are ending every training session on the floor, puking and bleeding yep. and, you know, screaming your lungs out. It's not going to be like that because that's not in your best interest long term. It's hard to have those conversations because a lot of athletes, they crave the feeling of going hard. Bro, right? like this, that's this, this, this. I don't get it. <laughs> Damn, I, I, I slipped. That's what plants crave. <laughs> You don't remember that? No. Oh, okay. Now, go on. Well, I tried to say photosynthesis. Oh, photosynthesis. It's what plants crave. You went like, <laughs> it sounded like you're drunk. I <laughs> did. Oh, because I and couldn't then I say the word. I was, I was the one that was slurring. <laughs> I was like, too. wait, I haven't drank yet today, have I? <laughs> No, uh, no, that was right. yesterday. That was just that was last <laughs> night. <Thursday. laughs> All right, I'm fired. Uh, um, oh, hell. I don't yeah. even know what I was saying. Yeah, saying. Oh no. So when you're trying to um, present that argument to an athlete, right? Like you having the data to be able to know we have space in our training schedule, whether it's a training year or a training like five-year plan to be able to take a step back and work on movement efficiency, it makes that argument a little bit more palatable. Right? Yeah. And I think that's important to have like, hey, listen, look, we have three years before you need to be able to maximally express the capacity that you have. Right. That means right now I have 18 months at least to be able to take a step back and work on movement efficiency and economy. This is the same conversation that Ben and I had. He was in this weird spot of like, right, getting ready to age up into mm -hmm. uh into the next age division. And it was like, we could, we could do it right now. We could try and make a push for it, but I feel like it might be a little bit better to wait. Let's wait. And he bought like, into that, right? He bought into yeah. it. I mean, he's a super cerebral guy. He was yeah. able to sort of think objectively about it. Like he's not like, just like, I want to bang my head against the wall to get better right now. So the conversation with him was a little bit easier, but thinking about that broad context and thinking about making sure that when you try and present that argument to the athlete, you also better freaking have that context to say it's okay because we don't have a super urgent timeline associated with your performance in terms of, we got to get you ramped up right away. Right. Right. Well, I think one of the things that people hear is that everyone's getting better at a really fast rate, which in general, if we look at open score to open score on the retest is true. The, the rate of performance gain in the sport or rate of improvement is like eight to 10% on some of these retests, which is incredible. Yeah. But the question that we're not asking is, is it person, is it that same individual that's testing in 2017 to 2021, like with the 17.1 and 21.2? Right. Right. So that's one question we need to ask ourselves is the actual same person that's going through this. And then also the other question is how long have they been doing the sport? So mm -hmm. Morning Chalk Up put out an article before the games that where they basically called these master athletes and said, hey, you know, are you still PRing? Are you, you know, making performance gains on your Metcons? And the overwhelming majority said, yes, I'm still improving at 50 years old or 52 years old. And while to some extent that may be true, 
one of the things that we need to think about is, well, how long have they been doing the sport? So even if you come in at 55 or 65 and you've never done a snatch, well, you should be PRing every single week. So that person may be getting better, yeah. but how do we compare that person to someone that's been in the sport for 20 years? Mm -hmm. Because I can guarantee you at 65, I'm not going to be PRing my snatch. Like I'm just not going to hit, you know, a 275 pound snatch at 65 that I did when I was 22. So those are kind of the first things you got to think about is like, Someone's training age plays a role in how fast they improve 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, 20 years down the road. It's always interesting to think about those kinds of data, right? And think about the kinds of people that respond to that survey are the kinds of people who are proud of their results and are right. more likely to say, yeah, I got better. If you, if you sent that email out to a hundred masters, masters athletes and 50% of them had gotten better and 50% of them gotten worse, this is the group that's going to reply to right. that. So it's going to skew your data. And it's interesting to think about that when we try and think about data inside the sport, it's about trying to make sure that the sample sizes make sense, but also that the population that you're sampling is equally distributed across that board or else we're yeah. just not going to get a clear picture. And then you present a like a result that might not be accurate right now, if I'm a master's athlete and I see that, like, it looks like 80 to 90% of my competitors are getting better. I'm like, oh, man, I'm just barely keeping my head above water exactly. here. I don't know if this sports for me anymore. You know, it's yeah. just, I, and I, it's just not the case. The, the data that we, that we were able to pull from like that same person going through year over year is maybe a one or 2%. It doesn't performance look like gain. what was presented. Correct. Right? It's not a 10% yeah. gain. It's not a 15% gain. It's not a 20 pound jump in their snatch. Like that just doesn't happen in those yeah. age groups. So I just say that not to make people miserable and like, Oh, I'm not going to get that much better, but it's like, no, that's the, that's realistic. Don't think that you have to gain 20 pounds in your snatch at 52 years old. Like that's just not going to happen unless you're brand new to the sport. Be okay with the small gains. And yeah. then also focus more, like you said, on some of those movement things so that you can, if, if possible, actually get a PR by cleaning up maybe your movement pattern. So you can get in a deep overhead squat. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to say that it's impossible to get a right. PR as you, as you age up into master's divisions. It, it absolutely For is sure. possible. And I I've have seen people. Yeah. I've seen it happen. Um, man, I remember one of the <laughs> most sobering things that Max ever said to me was like, uh, you know, you're probably getting pretty close to the point that you're not ever going to hit a PR again. I like, oh, <laughs> oh my man, God, I guess uh, I'm going to fire you. Yeah. Um, but there is going to be a point, right? There is going to be a point sure. where your performance is going to plateau. I'm going to use Chris's favorite word, asymptote. It is going to hit a point where it's going to stop <laughs> going up. Um, can you define? No, <laughs> Yeah, it's when the derivative is going yeah, closer. Yeah, don't to zero. start with yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rate of change. Um, so no, it's it's important for us as coaches to be the guardrails, like you said. Part of that yeah. is making sure that they stay focused, that they stay in their lane, that they're doing the kinds of things that are setting themselves up for success. Part of that is setting mental expectations for them. Be like, hey, listen, like those numbers aren't you. They don't have the same training age as you, the same biological age as you, the same movement background as you. They haven't been in the sport for as long as you. They don't have the elbow pain that you do. You comparing yourself to those numbers is doing yourself a disservice because yes. then you're going to start questioning things unnecessarily. You and I can sit back and, and create our own questions. Are we doing the right things? Are we comparing, you know, Ben from 2021 to Ben in 2018 to Ben in 2015? Is he doing the kinds of things that are setting himself up for success? But when you see those broad numbers like that, you need to think a little bit more about where they're coming from and not let them define like how you're going to try and, you know, guide yourself on this journey because I don't think that it's always going to be productive. Yeah. yeah. And that whole conversation, by the way, is not a knock on the the survey or those that are making gains. Like I, I, those people are, they're, yeah. they're super impressive, but I think it's just important that we kind of put that caveat on there. Like that's not a, that's not everyone in the sport. Like if you actually took 150,000 masters athletes and, and, and looked at it, the, the performance gains are a little bit smaller. Sure. Most people aren't PRing all the time. Those that are just really young in their training age. So those are all things to think about. There are still ways for us to make gains though. And that yeah. goes back to some of those things that we already talked about. And also the, even if you're not making gains, go back to that very first point. Sometimes it's just about mitigating the loss, mitigating the decay. Yeah. Don't, saying, don't shy away from the word. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. Mit let's mitigate mitigate that decay by trying to keep you at that level that you're at maybe before you age up so that when you do age up, that you're ready to compete in that new age division. Hey, what are you doing, girl? Mitigating that decay. Mitigate, yeah. mitigate, mitigate. All right. So I have a question. What makes a good master's athlete? To me, I think the first thing is someone that moves really well. Like if they move well, then it, after that, everything else can kind of fall together. Like yeah. it, it kind of falls into place. It's almost like, you know, oh, I have all these pieces of the puzzle now. I just like, it's pretty easy for a coach to put those together yep. after that. Um, even if someone doesn't have a big aerobic base or isn't very strong, like it's, it's pretty easy over a couple of years, at least to kind of clean some of those things up. The, the second thing though, would actually be strength to me 
over quote unquote, like aerobic capacity or their engine. If someone comes in, that's already moves well and is strong. Yeah. It's really Those easy to two be, together. Right. Yes. Cause you'll get somebody that comes in and it's strong, but they don't move well. Yes. And then that's not going to be sustainable. But if they move well and they're strong, I would love to be able to layer some engine on top of that. Right. And the engine it's, I know that that's the fancy thing in the CrossFit world. Like we all want to have big engines. And I say that like I have a big engine, but that doesn't mean much in the sport anymore. You have to be able to cycle heavy barbells. You have to be able to do the heavy one RMs. Like you think about it, we go back to the open last year, that four rep max front squat really screwed a lot of people that have engines, but couldn't squat a lot. I mean, it almost screwed some, some guys on site like Jake, who's Jake's a top 30 performer in the world in CrossFit, just Mm -hmm. CrossFit Metcons, but he barely barely made it in because, and he squatted like 335 pounds for four, yeah. which is impressive. Yeah. And again, that's not calling out Jake. Like he's unbelievable. I do CrossFit stuff with him. I'm like, I can't believe how fast he's going, but the strength is like, there's so much of a bias towards that now. And especially in the master's divisions, because, and here's why up until 55, you're doing the same weights as the 18 year old or the 22 year old. So that dumbbell, that 50 pound dumbbell or 35 pound dumbbell gets heavy as you age up, it's right? Already heavy. It's already yeah. Yeah, heavy. It is true. <laughs> or the same, they, they're using 315 pound deadlifts at 52 yeah. years old. So yeah. if you're strong, it doesn't really matter how fast you're going. If you can just pull that, you're going faster than most of the males or females in your age group. Yeah. The other interesting side of that is based off of the current scoring tables that you have for something like the open or the age group qualifier, where you're comparing yourself against tens of thousands of people. And then we know the master's athletes are a little bit more likely to retain strength as they go up in their age divisions. It's going to be a much more costly score for you to not have that strength number. That's why I completely agree. Strength is prerequisite on top of movement, economy, freedom, however you want to call it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, The tendency, it seems, and this probably will change, I would assume, over the next couple of years as the sport grows. Most master's athletes that are just getting into the sport that weren't the kind of like original CrossFitters that are aging up now are endurance athletes. They're, they come from an endurance background. They were triathletes or they were swimmers or run, just runners or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and they get into it because they still want to do something that's active. And they're like, Oh, there, there are some new skills. It's a little bit harder for those people. I, I think than those that come in that are naturally strong and move well, just because again, that limitation of strength. So if you're a triathlete, the likelihood of you being able to deadlift 315 pounds for 45 reps in an open workout, you're going to have to really train for that. It's hard to gain that strength as you get older. Right. It's pretty easy to at least get you to where your capacity is big enough to cycle that as long as you're strong enough to, to do that, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I think just comparing those areas in terms of like when we might call strength, when we might call skill, when we might call just aerobic capacity, having the prerequisite of just these are adequate, sufficient strength based numbers so that you don't bottleneck yourself there is one of the biggest things that we would say. Yeah. 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 Cool. And I think after that, then it more so than anything is just kind of mindset, like being okay. This is kind of the whole point of us, of the conversation we've had being okay with saying, I don't have to go hard every single day. Yeah. Or again, I just want to make that a paradigm shift. You do need to go hard, but sometimes hard just means a hard decision. Yeah. Backing off, right? A, cho- like, a choice is effort. Yes, exactly. You can choose effort for that day <laughs> exactly. or you can choose mobility for that day, but the choices might be the hard thing. It might not exactly. necessarily be the effort inside of that moment. Yeah. So I, I actually do love that motto of hard work pays off. Like I, I think that's true, but sometimes it's not the hard Metcon. It's the, the hard mobility or the, the other things that are the hard decision to make, but yeah. that's the right decision. I'm okay with hard work pays off. I just think that the uh, idea that that's the only part of the equation that matters is what's a little bit misleading sometimes because I feel like hard work is necessary. Well, I mean, is any slogan ever going to be the whole it's, equation. I mean, any model is no. going to miss something, but well, it's just like when, yeah, I, I, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, I love that motto. My, it, the problem is, is like what I'm saying is when I play, so this is an example just of my own like personal experience growing up it, that it was, I just need to go as hard as I can in the gym. Mm-hmm. I need to go as hard as I can in practice playing football. I'm going to go as hard as I can in the games. And all of that was good. But at some point I ended up injuring myself over and over and over again because I wasn't listening to my body. So to me, it's just the paradigm shift to saying sometimes hard work means taking care of my body. That's yeah. That was hard for me. Yeah. So that was the hard work I needed to do yeah. instead of being in the gym, trying to back squat every single day because I wanted to be the strongest guy on the team or run the fastest or whatever it was. So that's where I just want to have that kind of shift in our minds of thinking it's not just how hard I'm training. It's how hard I'm doing all of the things that lead to this enrichment of my performance. Yeah, I love that reframe. Did you have the biggest squad on your team? Uh, I don't think I ever did. Who did? Do you remember the guy's name? I don't. I bet he's broken. You know, you know what's crazy is there was um there was a guy on my high school football team, and this is a true story. He never came in and trained, 
he was a running back, unbelievable athlete, but he would come in for just like the back squat and bench press days when we had to like <laughs> lift you to do the maxes or whatever. And I want to say we we're probably sophomores or juniors and he'd do like five fifty for three didn't squat at all in high squatted. school. Yes. And it full, full depth. Like he, I'm talking about legit squat. Most of us, like I didn't even go full depth in high school. I was like barely going down. I didn't even squat in high school. He was so gifted, so strong. Golly. Yeah. That's super. Some people just have it like that. My I, cousin or my, my friend, Jason, his cousin came and trained with us NFL guy. Yeah. And we're, you know, like, let's squat. And we go start warming up. Me and Jason over there warming up. This man warms up with three fifteen for reps. <laughs> I'm just I like, was just oh like, my God. okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, no, you go away now. It really is crazy. It, but then you have some guys like it, I had the opportunity to go down and watch some combine prep and help out with some of that in my past life. And there were some like little DBs that couldn't squat at all. But mm. then they would be out there running their forties and running four three fives or four fours, and their broad jump would be ten and a half feet. Like they're still super explosive. It's just like everyone has these different gifts and abilities. Yeah. It's just really amazing. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, the presentation that you put together for the classroom, like it's, I think it's numbers that don't exist inside of the sport right now. And I think there's a ton of really good takeaways from it, but on, I think it was like your last slide, like, yes, numbers are important, but at the same time you need to have intangibles. Right. Yeah. And that exists along any sport, whether it's a sport like CrossFit that's been around for 12 years now, 13 years, or a sport like football or golf or baseball that's been around for hundreds of years, you still need to have intangibles on top yeah. of the data. And I think it's something that um, intangibles inherently we can't quantify, but it is important to still be able to think about that and move those markers up as the coach as well. Um, reframing your your perspective on that day's training, making sure that you're not always balls to the wall all the time. Those are intangibles in terms of the mindset that you were talking about that I think are going to set that athlete up for success. And then layering the numbers with that is going to be a, you know, I would say successful athlete over time. Yeah. I would say the last thing with that just means find a good support system. And yeah. that, that may be a coach that just may be a spouse, a, you know, whatever, a friend, a, a training partner, whatever it may be, having those people around you to help guide that process. And again, like you need people to kind of be the guardrails, whether that's a coach or not, like yeah. having somebody there to help you out with that, I think will help a ton. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Brandon, Brandon, Brandon. Wow. Can't you see? Didn't that time just fly by? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Peace, bye.